Yin and Yang, an eternal principle. When manifested into characters, it can take the form of a duo. This is a pillar that Dragon Ball has utilized since its humble beginnings to its current recognition in the pop culture zeitgeist. Every writer has his own literary toolbox at his disposal when composing the worlds and stories they envision. Toriyama is no exception to this. He has an assortment of literary devices when you step back and examine his series. One of those tools in his toolbox is the duo. A duo can be used for many different purposes in a story Story, and Dragon Ball has utilized many of those reasons throughout the years of its publication. To find the very first instance of a duo, we would have to go back to 1984 to the very inception of Dragon Ball, where we first meet two characters, Goku and Bulma. Both of these characters are introduced as a point of contrast to each other. By contrasting the differences between Goku and Bulma, not only do we learn more about them through their character interactions, but we are also informed about the world these two inhabit. Through Goku we learn about this world's remote, isolated locations, places of vast wilderness. Goku represents the rural side of the Dragon Ball world that has been prevalent throughout the series. Bulma on the other hand is used as a vector for the Dragon Ball world's technology technology and semblance of advanced civilization. Although throughout the first arc we never caught a glimpse of advanced civilization firsthand, we were still made aware of its existence somewhere in this world through Boma. That's something I've always found interesting about the Dragon Ball world, that it can harbor both futuristic cities to prehistoric landscapes, even the Wild West. And all of that is represented here in the very beginning with these two characters. Of course, the different origins of Goku and Bulma serve another purpose in this duo. One way Toriyama has preferred to display his characters' personalities is to contrast them with other characters and their personalities. This is the main dynamic between Goku and Bulma, and what has made both of them as a duo so interesting. They were perfect foils for one another. Bulma's selfish and technologically savvy nature is complemented extremely well by Goku's more altruistic and socially inept tendencies. Toriyama utilizes his characters desperate personalities to his advantage in the way we learn about them. The way we get to know them is by the way they interact and work off each other. Their different personalities, strengths, weaknesses is what made the dynamic of Goku and Bulma so engrossing throughout the first arc. Goku and Bulma are not the only duo present in the first arc, however. A little ways in, we are introduced to Yamcha and Poor. Although not as dynamic of a duo as Goku and Bulma, because it's clearly lopsided, with Yamcha being the main character of interest and Poir only being a sidekick to him. Although this pairing is mostly dictated by one character, Yamcha and Poir do establish a precedent in Dragon Ball. With Yamcha being the clear leader and Poir being a faithful servant and companion, Toriyama incorporates this setup in later duos in the series. The duo treatment is no stranger to the villains as well. From one-off monster carrot goons to the main antagonists of the entire story, Emperor Pilaf's loyal henchmen Mai and Shu are a prime example. While Shu is a tad bit more clumsy and Mai a bit more collected, it is only a matter of degree because they both are very similar. Mai and Shu share many similar traits with the dials turned up or down depending on what trait you're looking at. The purpose of this duo in the story is not to contrast, but to have someone similar to work off of. Toriyama could have easily have given Pilaf one henchman that was the median of the traits of Mai and Shu. And while this theoretical character might have been identical to Mai and Shu, it wouldn't have had the same impact in comedic opportunities that we get if this one character was actually two. What makes these two so interesting is once again the interactions they share that wouldn't have happened if they were just simply one character. Whether it's them griping about Pilaf's ridiculous plans or them fumbling about and failing to achieve their goals, it creates a lot of amusing moments. In the following story arc, Goku pursues his interest in martial arts. As such, he seeks the guidance of Master Roshi, a renowned expert. Through this, we are quickly introduced to a new character and the formation of a new duo, Krillin. When we first meet Krillin, his role is to be a rival to our protagonist. And while Krillin's character quickly adapts over to being Goku's best friend, the role of rival does not disappear from the series. It is periodically fulfilled by many throughout Dragon Ball's run, but in that long list of rivals, Krillin was the first. 
The main dynamic between Goku and Krillin is very similar to the one between Goku and Bulma. As with Goku and Bulma, Goku and Krillin serve as a point of contrast to one another. From the very moment of Krillin's introduction, we are informed about his personality by how it conflicts and differs with Goku. While Krillin is clever and willing to bend the rules, Goku is a bit too honest and naive to attempt such schemes. It was these dueling personalities which made the dynamic between Goku and Krillin so interesting if a bit short-lived. With the conclusion of the 21st World Tournament and going into the Red Ribbon Army arc, the significance of duos in the overarching story did diminish quite a bit. That isn't to say duos aren't present in the Red Ribbon Army arc, because they are. Two such duos are Bora and Upa, as well as Officer Black and Commander Red. Now I don't have any deep analysis of both of these examples, but instead an observation in similarity. As I've discussed already, Toriyama likes to have his duos contrast in terms of personalities to each other. However, he does this in another way. In fact, it's a running theme of how he designs his characters. Bora, Upa, Commander Red, and Officer Black are great examples of this running theme. And it is simply their stature. One is much bigger in comparison to the other. It's a point of contrast in a more superficial way, but it's a design philosophy that Toriyama incorporates and in many of his duo's designs, from Yamcha Puar, Tian Shin Han Chao Tzu, Vegeta Nappa, all the way up to Supreme Kai and Kibito, it's something that can instantly communicate to the viewer as a point of difference, just as the underlying personalities are a point of difference. This design philosophy, however, is used to greater or lower effect depending on the quality of characters we're discussing here, though. Case in point, entering into the 22nd tournament arc, we're introduced to Tian Shin Han and Chao Tzu, one of the most instantly striking things about them when we we're first introduced is of course their statures, Toriyama's running theme. Tian Shin Han big guy, Chao Tzu little guy. Apart from this though, I don't have much else to comment on this duo since there really isn't a lot of meat on this one. It isn't because Tian Shin Han is a particularly bad character, the problem lies more with Chao Tzu and his complete lack of characterization. It's this deficiency that really brings this duo down. Oh well, not all duos can be home runs. One defeat of a King Piccolo later and Goku ascends to the heavens, and there we are greeted by two heavenly beings. Mr. Popo and Kami. And while in the confines of this story arc, we really don't get to see the intricacies of Mr. Popo's and Kami's relationship, and we'd have to wait until later story arcs for us to get more explicit details, Toriyama does establish a precedent here for his god characters, and that is the person of interest, the god, and his faithful servant and companion. Now we've seen glimpses of this with duos and pairings such as Yamcha and Puar, with Yamcha being the dominant and character of interest, while Puar is mostly on the sidelines, Toriyama uses this setup and sprinkles in a god context for us. Obviously gods are beings of high authority, and the preferable way Toriyama likes to demonstrate that authority to his audience is by having a faithful servant at his side. It's been a consistent and tried and true method for him as he has used this method all the way up until his creation of Beerus and Whis. Although Kami and Mr. Popo are not the strongest characterizations of this archetype in the series, they are the first example of this. But with Dragon Ball rolling on, and with Goku being declared the world's strongest fighter, we enter in a new era. A new era of new catastrophes and world-expanding possibilities. The new antagonists for this arc come in once again, a pairing, a duo you could say. Vegeta and Nappa, in my estimation, are the most effective pair of villains in the entire series. As a pair, Toriyama's obsession with differentiating statures is used to its fullest to create a significant presence when these two villains make an entrance. With Nappa being the big guy spearheading the charge against our protagonists, it creates a nice ominous mystery around Vegeta. Accompanied by Vegeta barking orders at Nappa demonstrating which one of them really is in charge is a great way to get the audience anxious for what Vegeta is capable of. All this serves as a build-up for the unveiling of Vegeta's character and the final showdown with Goku. All this could have not been accomplished if Vegeta was simply alone. By introducing Vegeta with Nappa, the significance of Vegeta Vegeta is raised. Like I've been demonstrating it throughout this video, it gives someone for Vegeta to interact off of. And for Vegeta, what that really means is someone to hover his authority over, to demonstrate and not just be told that Vegeta is some royal and high class Saiyan. Vegeta, however, is more well known for being part of another duo. A rivalry of sorts. 
the rivalry of Goku and Vegeta. Although Vegeta wasn't introduced for the purpose of being Goku's rival, he developed into the most formidable foil of Dragon Ball's main protagonist. Goku and Vegeta's rivalry is one of the most prominent aspects of Dragon Ball that endures all the way up until Dragon Ball Super. The reason it has lingered for so long is because of what Dragon Ball is and who Goku and Vegeta are and where they come from. Dragon Ball started off as a light-hearted adventure story full of quirky and wacky characters that was loosely based on the old story Journey to the West. Dragon Ball back then was colored by silly personalities and cartoony antics. However, over the years of Dragon Ball's publication, Dragon Ball morphed into a very conflict battle-centric series where battles for the sake of the world and people's lives were at stake. It's not that the silliness disappeared completely, but the main focus of Dragon Ball became about the drama of seeing your favorite characters overcome adversity. In a lot of these stories that Dragon Ball turned into revolved around strength. Strength became an increasingly important underlying factor in resolving the conflicts in Dragon Ball, and so Goku's character, who was always about him getting stronger, complemented that story perfectly. And in comes Vegeta. Vegeta, someone who was blessed with natural gifts. Being strong was not a goal of his, because he already was strong. One has to keep in mind that Vegeta was at the top of Saiyan hierarchy, a position his family most likely attained because of their fighting prowess. It's this endowment that Vegeta has inherited from his pedigree. Vegeta was the strongest amongst the Saiyans, and that's the way it should be. It's just natural law. This is Vegeta's worldview. Contrary to this, Goku views his strength as something that he had to will into the world himself. In Goku's mind, he has attained his strength through his own volition. He doesn't see his strength as a manifestation of his bloodline, but of his own deep wishes. On top of all this, the engine that Goku and Vegeta's motivations run on have differing foundations. While Vegeta is animated to his training to be the strongest, Goku is animated to simply be stronger. This is why we consistently see Vegeta so agitated, knowing that there's another Saiyan stronger than him. Like Goku and Bulma before them, Goku and Vegeta complement their personalities extremely well within the context of a rivalry. From a very basic emotional level, we can parse out Vegeta is angry as opposed to Goku being happy. This basic difference can be taken in a multitude of directions which Dragon Ball has employed in many different forms. From the dramatic, paradigm-shifting set pieces to the mundane, light-hearted comedic release, Goku and Vegeta as a duo have a vast array of interactions of potential to exhaust, which Dragon Ball has taken advantage of to its fullest. Which is why for the entirety of Dragon Ball Super's run, the Goku and Vegeta relationship is the premier one. It is the main event. Frieza is arguably the most iconic villain Dragon Ball has ever had. Within his arc, none rivaled his presence. His status as tyrannous ruler was absolute. With the exception of the rogue Vegeta, no one questioned or challenged his order. Because of this, one would think that Frieza would be the last character to be incorporated into a duo. For those of you who came to that conclusion, you underestimate Toriyama's propensities. In the following story arc, we are made aware of Frieza's father, King Cold. There isn't much to say about the king himself, due to the fact that he had a very short stint in the series. However, his relationship to Frieza creates one of the biggest juxtapositions in relation to social standing in the entire series. Frieza's social standing in the previous arc was that of an uncompromising ruler. Frieza cared only about himself, and it almost really did seem that Frieza didn't need all these soldiers and lackeys. He could do it all himself. King Cold was different though. Although within the context of their relationship, Frieza was probably the ultimate authority, but judging by their short-lived interactions, Cold seemed to have some sway over Frieza that cannot be said for anyone else. He was the only other person that Frieza had had any semblance, any ounce of respect towards. Which when you think about it seems strange when you juxtapose that to the Frieza of the previous arc, who was completely uncompromising to absolutely everyone. With the introduction of the Cell arc, of course it's no strangers to duos. In fact, we meet two of them, both of the Android class. Android 19 and 20, and 17 and 18. With 19 and 20, there isn't much to comment, considering that they didn't have much screen time, and as such, they didn't have time to 
develop that relationship. Although considering Android 19's wooden and robotic personality, there probably wasn't much of personality or character substance there. 17 and 18 on the other hand remind me of a different archetype. Just like Maya and Shu in the very beginning, 17 and 18 aren't too dissimilar to themselves in terms of their personalities, as well as their designs. That's not to say that they're exactly the same, but that for the purposes of the story, both of them are mayhem-loving, mischievous characters that like to cause chaos. Both of them might have their personality quirks that set them apart, but like Mai and Shu from way in the beginning, their personality traits are similar and their dials are turned up or down depending on what traits you're looking at. 17 and 18 are the villain duo of Mai and Shu transplanted into a new era of Dragon Ball. Moving on to the world of TV specials, it's a duo versus duo in the history of Trunks. We've already touched upon 17 and 18, but the critical duo in this special is Gohan and Trunks. This relationship is what the entire special hinges on. Trunks, someone who grew up in a devastated world. Although he has never known what peace is, he does know one thing, that the world he lives in is a sick one. He sees Gohan as the only one putting up a meaningful resistance to his chaotic order. And for this, Trunks puts his hopes that Gohan could bring his nightmare to an end. But the feeling is mutual, for Gohan isn't completely confident that he can bring an end to the android menace himself. So he puts his hope in Trunks. To Gohan, Trunks represents the future, the future of humanity, and therefore the hope that in the future the terror of the androids could be brought to an end. Both of them are highly invested in each other's potential to destroy the androids, but it's more than this. To Trunks, Gohan is the closest person that he has ever had to a father. Trunks seeks guidance not just in fighting and training, which he does, but also in making sense of this cruel world that he inhabits. Of course, Gohan is eager to impart part any knowledge or wisdom at his disposal to ease Trunks' pain. For you can make the case that Trunks is the closest thing Gohan has ever had to a son. This is why I think Gohan's inevitable death is one of the saddest moments in all of Dragon Ball. Gohan was Trunks' anchor to any semblance of hope that the world would change for the better. Not only have they invested physically with each other through their training, but Trunks has emotionally bonded and invested in Gohan. So when Trunks loses him, leaving him to fend for himself in a harsh world, one could see that turmoil that devastated Trunks. As Dragon Ball carries forward into the Buu arc, the progeny of the two most seminal characters make their debut. Although they weren't introduced together like other duos in the series, Goten and Trunks, like their fathers before them, share a rivalry. But unlike their fathers, it's a much more juvenile and playful rivalry that doesn't supersede their relationship. Unlike their fathers, which have a very abrasive relationship because of their high competitive nature, Goten and Trunks find solace in the fact that they are the only ones that can uniquely relate to each other. The reason for this is because they find themselves in comparable circumstances. Goten and Trunks both obviously are children, and as such, like most youngsters, they relate uniquely among their adolescent peers. However, unlike most youth, both Goten and Trunks possess extraordinary abilities. These exceptional abilities are a source of camaraderie that reinforce the bond they already share. It is these abilities that allow Goten and Trunks to engage in a level of juvenile antics that no one would participate in because of their age and their maturity, or could participate in because of their lack of ability. However, Toriyama's propensity to pair his characters off is not just seen in Goten and Trunks, but even in insignificant villains. Spopovich and Yamu are a prime examples. Although Spopovich and Yamu are ultimately irrelevant to the plot of the arc, Toriyama still chooses to incorporate his duo design philosophy even in these minor characters. Moving on to more relevant characters, we have the Supreme Kai and Kabito, which echo the duo dynamics of Kami and Mr. Popo. Along with a persistent stature difference present in many of these duos, they also share a relationship of God and Attendant. But aside from that, Kabito fulfilling the role of Faithful Servant and Supreme Kai being the God that fails in his duties, there isn't much else to talk about in this relationship. I want to take a slight detour into the realm of the Dragon Ball Z movies. More specifically, Broly, the legendary 
Super Saiyan. Obviously, most of the discussions about the antagonists of this picture revolve around Broly, which is understandable since he's the main character of interest and in the wake of this film, left behind the biggest legacy in this franchise for a movie character. With all the recognition Broly has gotten over the years, Paragus has fallen to the wayside, which is quite disappointing because he plays an extremely important part in this movie and especially with his relation to Broly. Paragus, not Broly, is the villain that drives the plot of the story. Paragus is the one that gives character motivations and substance to the antagonists of this film, while Broly gives the audience a visceral spectacle of combat with our protagonists. Whenever people examine the villain of this movie and come to the conclusion that the villain Broly lacks any real character, making him dull, I can't help but think that they miss the point slightly. Because in the terms of this first film, Broly is only playing a dual role as villain here. Broly is just a mere tool in Paragus' grand scheme to seek revenge on Vegeta. I always thought it was more appropriate to think of Broly as a monster character, a force of nature akin to Godzilla. When viewed from this perspective, I think Broly fulfills his half of the villain role adequately. Both Broly and Paragus are a pair and provide different things to the antagonists of this film, and both of them together arguably make the best pair of villains for all of the Dragon Ball movies. Dragon Ball GT doesn't have many duos that come to mind, however, there is one example that stands out. In the last arc of Dragon Ball GT, we're introduced to Nova and Ice Shenron. At their most basic, Nova fights with fire and Ice fights with, well, Ice. Traditionally and throughout many stories, they have been in divergence from each other, in opposition, and as such, their characters follow through from this premise. While Nova is honorable and seeks a fair fight to test his abilities, Ice has a cutthroat approach to combat, seeking only the victory. When Nova had the opportunity to use Pan as cover for him to gain an advantage in the fight with Goku, he refused to take advantage of that boy. Because for him, fighting is to test your own abilities and to ascertain how skilled you are. In that sense, Nova does share a lot of qualities with Goku. Ice, on the other hand, when presented with the opportunity to use Pan, did, and used her to gain the upper hand on Goku. Because for Ice, victory is all that matters. After the end of Z, Toriyama retired from writing manga on a consistent basis. However, following this hiatus, Toriyama briefly returned to the world of Dragon Ball, with Yosung Goku and his friends return. Along with Toriyama's glorious return comes his trusty tropes of the trade, the duo. And it's a two-for-one say. Yosun Goku is most fondly remembered for the introduction of Vegeta's long-lost brother, but he was not alone. He was accompanied by his wife, whose, uh, name eludes me at the moment. Uh, anyway, uh, duos, who likes food puns? Ava and Kado. Not much else to say on this one. Moving on. The 2013 Battle of Gods movie ushered in a new era of Dragon Ball and brought with it two big personalities, Beerus and Whis. Toriyama has used the God-Servant dynamic before, but these two are his best iteration yet. In previous God-Servant duos, the Servant might suffer from a lack of characterization. This is especially true in the case of Kabito, where his lack of characterization ultimately makes him flat and forgettable. Whis, on the on the other hand, escapes this pitfall by having a well-defined character and personality which equals his counterpart Beerus. Like many of the greatest comedy duos, they share a straight man and absurdist dynamic, with Whis playing the role of straight man and Beerus being the bombastic absurdist. Like many of Toriyama's greatest duos, not only do they have a superficial stature difference, but they have distinct and contrasting personalities that play well off each other and help them stand out as individuals which is further exemplified in future outings in Resurrection F and Super where their individual personalities are able to shine outside of their duo relationship. This makes Beerus and Whis one of the strongest pair of duos in the entire series because the greatest duos in Dragon Ball or in any story, really. Not only do the two characters work well with each other for whatever the purpose of the duo is, but they're also just good characters individually fully realized on their own. But going on into Super, Beerus and Whis do establish a precedent for the God Hierarchy. As Super reveals more details about the God Hierarchy and the existence of more universes, we are made aware of the existence of more angels and more gods of destruction, which guess what? Means more duos. 
The first example of this long line conveyor belt of gods was Vados and Champa. Like Beerus and Whis before them, Vados and Champa do follow the straight man and absurdist dynamic. Vados of course playing straight man, Champa playing absurdist. Which is not to say that they have the same personalities as the previous two, as there are definitely differences. Between the brothers, Champa is definitely the more petulant and bratty of the two, akin to a spoiled child. And as for Whis, Whis definitely has some degree of trust in Beerus's judgment, which the same cannot be said for Vados and her faithfulness in Champa's judgment. Future Trunks makes his triumphant return to Dragon Ball, but this time, he's not the only future character of interest. He's accompanied by his fellow resistance fighter, Mai. I think the main reason why Toriyama or the writers or whoever made this decision included Mai along with Future Trunks was because they wanted someone for Future Trunks to relate to in terms of the devastation that the future world has brought. And I think that that's the role that Mai serves in this arc. Unlike the previous arc in which Trunks did return to the past from a destroyed future, Trunks was the only one in that situation who could really understand the hardships that he has been through, as of course no one in the present could relate to the world that he has come from. And that's the role Mai serves, for someone for Trunks to interact and relate to. But also pairing off Trunks and Mai romantically also sprinkles in a little differentiation there, since you really don't see that in Dragon Ball duos or in Dragon Ball period. Another duo worth mentioning is Zamasu and his best friends forever, Zamasu. Well, technically, the same person, Goku Black displays in his actions and body language a more indecorous nature, unlike his more dignified counterpart. <laughs> anyway. With the defeat of the Zamasus, the long-awaited Tournament of Power finally begins. And with it, the clash of all the universes and a slew of new characters are introduced. And with so many characters being introduced, you can bet a hundred million zenny that Toriyama won't waste this opportunity to guess what? Introduce another duo. And thus, we get two female Saiyans, Kale and Khalifla, and they are in the long vein of contrasting personalities. Khalifla, brash, loud, confident, and impulsive, while Kale is more shy, reserved, unsure, and dependent. They say first impressions are important, and that's exactly what Kale and Khalifla interacting off each other, exemplifying their character's personalities do. Kale and Khalifla's dynamic in particular is that of older and younger siblings, where the younger is dependent and has admiration for the older's achievements, almost to the extent of hero worship, while the older is much more protective and eager to impart knowledge on her younger counterpart. This is the dynamic we see manifest in the Tournament of Power. By no means was this a completely comprehensive take on duos in Dragon Ball, as I know that I missed a couple, Krillin and Gohan comes to mind, along with Plague and Terror although I'm not sure how relevant they are to the entire story of Dragon Ball. Regardless, if you've watched this video, we can be rest assured of one thing. With a new Dragon Ball movie on the horizon, and the very real possibility of Dragon Ball continuing in some form in the future, we can rest assured that duos are definitely going to be a part of it. But anyway guys, that's my video. And until next time, I'm Black and Fist, and farewell. You, hey, by the way, Jay, tell me if this, uh, you listening to this? Jay? I am. Okay, uh, tell me, tell me if this is a good British accent. If it's not, you, you tell me, please. While technically the same person, Goku Black displays in his actions and body language a more indecorous nature, unlike his more dignified counterpart. <clears throat> you sound like Android 13. <laughs> Android 13? Damn, dude, I... Okay. Shit!